that's that you can number out. I hope that I think a few folks uh, got a little practice at how to get to church, so that's good. <laughs> I'm glad to see you here. Uh, we were wondering about all the churches on Washington Avenue. I know the other year, I think most of them just canceled church, but they really got things blocked off with the race. But I hope that that's their cup of tea and they enjoy that type of thing. I hope they stay safe and have a good race today. It's good to see you all in church this morning. Let's uh, raise our voices to the Lord and uh, on this Pentecost Sunday and rejoice in the Holy Spirit as we sing our opening hymn, uh, number 237. On Pentecost, they gather. 237. Stand and Give us courage 
that we may not fear the tongues of flame, that all that is unworthy, impure, and sinful be burned from our lives. May we know that it is love that burns so brightly and love that strips away our sin. Give us an open mind, Lord, that the truth you bring may make its home with us. Truth to set us free. Truth to guide us and inform us. Truth to lead us in the way of your will. Give us an open heart, Lord, that we may seek all people for your realm and set no limits to the proclaiming of your word. Holy Spirit, with the whole church, we wait for you in every place and in every generation. Come wind, come fire, come truth, come love. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning's scripture reading from the book of Acts comes from chapter 2, of course. On Pentecost Sunday, let's read verses 1 through 21. Acts 2, 1 through 21. And there we read these words. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, and they came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, well, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, and he raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Remembering those that we just mentioned and shared together with our church family and those who are in print on our bulletin and some who have been there for quite some time, let's continue to remember those in a thought and mode of prayer as we sing our hymn of prayer. Sweet, sweet spirit. Uh, we always sing this one through. It's so short. We sing it through two times. So sweet, sweet spirit number 261 in your hymn.
again this morning. Again, grateful to be in your, your house of worship this morning, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, this morning, a special prayer for those that are sick this morning that can't be with us, that would love to be here with us. Those that are traveling and those that may have an excuse not to be here because of the traffic this morning. Whatever reason, Lord, we have to reach out and bring them back to us, Lord. Lord, this morning I pray for our country. Our country, as I've said before, is in dire divide, dire distress. Another shooting I just heard about a while ago. It's happening all over our country, Lord. I don't know what we're going to do, but Lord, I'm asking you to help. We ask you to guide us to everything that we do and say. Again, Lord, as always, I pray for our military, our firefighters, our police officers, our doctors and nurses. Lord, these people are going in behind all this mess to clean it up. But we keep them in mind and pray for them, especially those they're working, to keep us safe. Again, Lord, watch over us through this day and through this week. Forgive us for many sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the song. I'll be reading the song verses 25 to 35. There is a sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Davidian which you form to follow there. These all look to you to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to dust, to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created. When you renew the face of the earth, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing Praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We give you thanks, O oh God, for your gifts to each of us so generously given that we might further your word. Let us sing our song of praise unto you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.
Thanks be to God. Preparing our hearts for Holy Communion this morning. Number 254 is our communion hymn. Breathe on me, breath of God. 254.
shed for the many. Take and drink in remembrance of me. Peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Amen. Let us fellowship with one another from our seat this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Anything in my name, and I will do it. 
If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The word world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. May God add the blessing and understanding to the reading of his word. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray just before the message. Father God, as we've gathered here as this small band of believers on this Sunday morning, first Sunday morning in June, on this Pentecost Sunday, Lord, we have sung and talked about and read Scripture about the Holy Spirit. Now reveal to us through the words that are about to go forth how truly important the Holy Spirit is in the life of any Christian. Help us, Father, to be attuned to what we're talking about this morning, the subject matter, and to hear it clearly. Father, we pray that you would remove from our hearts and our minds anything that would prevent us today from hearing what your Holy Spirit would say to us. We pray all of these things and so much more that escapes our hearts and minds at this time. We pray it in Jesus' name and all of God's children said, Amen. A hospital chaplain works with people from all walks of life. If they come in the hospital and you're the chaplain, chances are you're going to deal with them at some point, or many of them, all races, all nationalities, all cultures, all backgrounds. And a lady who I follow her, her writing, she's a, a, a chaplain in Massachusetts, and she wrote this in her blog. She said, I had one patient who only spoke Portuguese. And whenever I would make my rounds, she would start shouting at me in Portuguese. She said, if you've never heard someone shout at you in Portuguese, you're really in for a treat. She said, I had no clue what she was saying, but it was very loud and very forceful. And she said, to me, it was obvious that she was upset. So what I would usually do when I went into her room or past her room was just apologize, the only way I knew how, in English, and I would get out of there as quickly as possible. One day I went back, and the same thing happened, only this time, her family was around. And one of the family members also spoke English. And she saw my demeanor. And she said, do you know what she's saying? And I said, no, but whatever I did, I'm sorry. And then she told me, she said, no, no, no. She said, she's speaking Portuguese, of course, and our language can sometimes come across a little differently. And she said, she was yelling joyfully about how glad she was to see her because the old lady's eyesight was failing a little bit, and every time this chaplain would come in, dimly through her poor sight, she thought it was a relative of hers. So she would start yelling and, and rejoicing and proclaiming in Portuguese about how glad she was that she had come to see her and to visit her. So she said, after that day, I would always come in and talk to her as much as I could, and I understood now that though I couldn't understand her, she was happy. She said, I learned from that experience that translation matters. It can change everything. So today's story is about translation too. It's ten days after the ascension when Jesus left this world and the disciples are together trying to figure out what to do now that Jesus is gone. And all of a sudden, that rushing wind with tongues of fire fell on them that we read about. And suddenly the disciples, all of whom were Galileans, were just speaking the same language. They were speaking languages that they had never known before. People from other places were nearby, it says, and they heard it and they could understand what they were saying. And they all said, how come we're hearing this in our own language? Some didn't even believe it. Remember, they said, well, they must be drunk. But Peter says, he gets up and looks and says, look, it's only 9 a.m. We're not drunk. Instead, something new has come and everything has changed. In the church, we call this day Pentecost, which is translated roughly to mean 50 days. So it's 50 days after Easter. That's hard to believe, isn't it? And we call that mighty rush of wind that came down the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
And we call this the birthday of the church. A lot of churches, I grew up in the Baptist church, and I'm not demeaning the Baptist church, but a lot of Baptist churches doesn't like to talk about the Holy Spirit. It's something foreign to them. It's, uh, it's in the Bible, and they know, but it's just one of those things we don't talk about it, we don't express it. Uh, we never celebrated Pentecost. We didn't sing a lot of Pentecost hymns. Um, it's just something that different denominations do different ways. But we call it the birthday of the church because it's the day when the gift of the Holy Spirit was given to the disciples, and we consider the church being born. I've always found it interesting because intuitively it may not make a whole lot of sense, right? If you, if you stop and think about it, shouldn't Easter be the birthday of the church? After all, that's the day Jesus rose again and appeared to the disciples. Maybe we could even make the argument that Christmas should be the birthday of the church because it is Christ's birthday, right? Or maybe Monday Thursday when Christ tells the disciples to go out and love one another. That all-important mandate that he gave to love one another. Maybe that should be the birthday of the church. But most theologians believe Pentecost is the church's birthday. And I think it's because it's the day that the disciples went from being this loose, ragtag <coughs> bunch of followers of Jesus standing around waiting on Him for direction and wondering what to do next to being equipped by the Holy Spirit to minister not just on their own, but to go out to the whole world and carry that good news. And I think it says a whole lot that on its day of birth, when the Holy Spirit came down, the first gift that the disciples realized they have is the gift of being able to speak in new languages. New languages. The ability to translate the message of God to others whom they otherwise couldn't have communicated with. Just like the chaplain's story, Emily's story earlier about translation by someone telling her what was being shouted in Portuguese. She then knew it wasn't in anger, but it was in happiness and joy. One night when I was on rounds at Roanoke Memorial, on visitation rounds, I passed by a room where a man was standing at the bedside of a woman. And his head was bowed and he was speaking very fervently in a different language. I have no idea what those words were that he was saying. But in that moment, without knowing a word of his language, I knew exactly what he was doing because of his body posture and position and the place, the location that he was in and what was going on. I could pretty much infer what was being said. If the Holy Spirit were to sweep into this place again today, like the scripture described, and give us all a birthday gift because we are the church, right? I think we would get the same gift the disciples got. And I don't mean by that that we would all be able to speak and understand Spanish or Chinese or Russian or Arabic per se. But rather, I think we would want the gift of learning how to speak in new ways to those who haven't yet heard about God's love, right? in a language that they understand. And you don't have to leave the country to find people who have it. You don't even have to leave the Roanoke Valley. Just look at the news. A few weeks ago, I read a poll in the news about how fewer and fewer people considered themselves religious now. It made the front page of a lot of major papers. And so, here we are in the church speaking what a lot of people around us would consider a foreign language. You know, I can remember the older than I am. You know, the older I get, the younger that age seems to get. I think people that were my age were old, were old, but not anymore. But I can even remember when I was a kid and went to church, even people in our neighborhood and community who didn't go to church they knew what Easter was. They knew what Pentecost was. They knew what the doxology was and why you sang it in church. They knew a lot of church words and church language. They knew the Lord's Prayer and could recite it from heart. There was a time when most people knew our language as the church. But they don't anymore. And that's something new to us. We find that for it. Because we've always been here. Most of us, I look around in this room and see, I've grown up with you all. We 
we've always been in the church. So it's foreign to us now that the fringes around us, the, the neighborhoods that we're trying to reach, don't know a whole lot of anything about church. And you know, don't misinterpret this, but that's also not necessarily bad. Because it doesn't mean that ours is a language that isn't worth sharing or making understood. It just means that we need to learn to share it in different ways. Far too long, much of the church has stood still, angry at the world that nobody understands us anymore. Nobody speaks our language. We complain about that fact, and we have plenty of things to blame. I probably even said a few of them from the pulpit. I think one time years ago I even did a sermon on why church attendance had fallen away. And if we talked about the blue laws, and there was nowhere else to go on Sunday. So, you know, you gathered up the family, you went to church. You went for a picnic on the parkway after, and that was pretty much it. If you needed a prescription, you could go to people's drugstore over at Towers, because that was the only store just about that was open on Sundays. But I've told you before, people, very few people, are going to spontaneously show up at our door and walk in the church and say, here I am. We have to go out into the world. We, the best way to get a church to grow, I've said this before too, is to invite someone personal. Come with me. You may get turned down a million times, but invite someone personal to come to church with you. And every once in a while, that someone will say, well, sure, I believe I will. A good friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a hairdresser, your grocery store cashier. But do we notice anything in particular about the Pentecost story? When the Holy Spirit comes, who is it that learns the new language? The disciples. The disciples learn the new language. All the other people there don't suddenly speak the disciples' language. Instead, the disciples learn to speak theirs. And I think maybe the Holy Spirit is trying to tell us something. We can't wait for others to talk the way we talk. Instead, we need to learn their language. And of course, now at this point in the sermon, we've moved on from talking about whether you speak Spanish or English or Russian or French. We're talking about the church language versus the language of the world. We have to learn what's important to those people. We have to learn to be able to communicate in ways that matter to them. We have to be willing to step out of our comfort zone and make the connections with those people. It's what the church is supposed to have been doing since its earliest days. And it's what we're still called to do today in those small ways even, going out into the world, befriending people, respecting them, loving them, caring for them, feeding them, clothing them. I've said my entire life, if you bring somebody and go out there and drag them into the church and they're hungry, they're not going to listen to one hymn. They're not going to listen to a word that comes out of my mouth because they're hungry. But what if we feed them? What if we do like this church and support the rescue mission and feed their physical hunger and then we were to offer them God's Word. They might be more apt to listen. We have to be willing to do those types of things. And more importantly, we have to have something to say when we're trying to speak their language. Gone are the days when people come to church out of obligation. And I think that's probably a good thing. Because what that means is the people coming through our doors are looking for something deeper. They're looking for a community to connect with, friends that they can share things with that are going on in their lives, people to lean on in their time of need. <clears throat> and more than anything, they're looking for a spiritual connection. The Holy Spirit is what we in the church have to offer them. Christ has gone away. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father right now making intercession for us. But He told us before He left He would leave us an advocate. Someone who was always there with us. That being the Holy Spirit. So that's what we have to offer the world. We as Christians believe that God speaks to us and leads us and guides us through the Holy Spirit. 
It's our companion and our guide through life. It's what gives us comfort when we need it and courage when we're done being comforted and are ready to step out and make a move for the Lord. Jesus called it the paraclete, which means, as I said earlier, advocate or helper. The Holy Spirit is our advocate and our helper. I mean, why wouldn't we want to claim that and share it with others, right? And so, on this Pentecost, on this birthday of the church, we, you and I, right here today, at First Christian Church of Benton, we can make a choice. Because Pentecost didn't just happen 2,000 some years ago and stop. It happened still. And on Pentecost, we're given an incredible gift in the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that will never wear out. It's a gift that will never grow too small. It's a gift that will never go out of style, like all the ties in my closet at home. It's a gift that will never fail to amaze us if we only let it. But here's the catch. We can't hold on to that gift for only ourselves. It has to be shared. And if you received it, it will be shared through your life that you live out in the world every week, wherever you go. It will be shared from Kroger to the gas pumps and sheets when you're giving away all your money. Uh, it will be shared over the back fence in your neighborhood. It will be shared on the street corner as you walk down the street, maybe getting your exercise. It will be shared at the gym. Everywhere you go, the Holy Spirit will pour forth from you and through you to those that you come in contact with. And that's an exciting thing. That's an exciting You're just living your life and sharing Christ with others. And the Holy Spirit is leading you and guiding you to do that. And so this Pentecost, I encourage you, unwrap your gift. Unwrap your birthday gift. And delight in the way you would any good gift. But don't stop there. Share it with the world around you because they have such a deep spiritual need, especially in this day and age. Learn to speak the language of those around us who thirst for spiritual death. And follow the Holy Spirit into all the places that God has already prepared for you to go. And you may find that behind every corner, a never-ending birthday celebration awaits. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Breath of life on this Pentecost Sunday, we ask that you breathe on us once again. Make our consciences tender to your touch. Even though we get busy with our lives down here, Lord, we hunger for the life-changing power that your Holy Spirit brings. May our lives exemplify the fruit of your Spirit. May we exude that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. May we use the gifts of the Spirit that you have distributed to bless the church and to build up your kingdom on earth. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, we continue to lift up those on our prayer list, those who were shared by name earlier in our time of sharing. We pray that you comfort any who have lost loved ones, those who are sick, Grant unto them your healing and your peace. Make us your hands and your feet here upon earth and help us to provide for those in need, whatever that need might be. Give us courage to speak up for others who have no voice on this earth. And Lord, as always, for the things that we've done that we shouldn't have and the things that we've left undone that we should have, we ask for your grace, mercy, and forgiveness to be poured out upon us. Be with the leaders of all nations. Give them wisdom and knowledge to do those things and make those decisions which are just and right. Teach them your ways. Bring healing and hope to people around the world who are overwhelmed by their circumstances. We continue to remember especially the people of Ukraine this day. Help us all to work toward a life of peace with one another until your coming. We lift up our doctors, our nurses, our caregivers, our law enforcement, EMT, and firefighters. Bring them safely home to their loved ones this evening and heal those who are wounded. 
be it body, mind, or spirit. Keep us all safe and healthy in the week ahead, and we also pray against the resurgence of the coronavirus in our communities. And to this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. God, and protect your church, O oh God, let us cherish and share the gifts that you have given us with others. Give it grace to proclaim them boldly and faithfully. We pray this day for Terry, our general minister and president, for Bill, our regional minister here in Virginia. We pray for each one of our deacons, deaconesses, and elders here at First Church. We ask your blessings upon each one of these, our members and friends who are present, and those who are not here with us today, as they go out into the world this week to carry forth your word. To this we say, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, now as we close this service, we pray that you speak to us through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Change our hearts and minds, and as we sing a hymn to your name, we pray that decisions of everlasting importance might be made. We pray all of these things in the name of Christ our Savior, as he spoke these words to teach us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn, if you have any decision at all to make and share with your church family, please do so and come forward. Someone will be here with you at the front. We'll sing together hymn number 253, Spirit, Come, Dispel Our Sadness.
Go in peace, love and care for one another in the name of Christ, and go out into God's world filled with the spark of the Holy Spirit. Let love guide your actions and listen for the spirit of truth. Spread the peace of Christ and remind everyone you meet that each one is a beloved child of God. Amen. God bless you. Have a great night. Love you all. Yes. Thank you.